Hello, I'm Lawrence Holgate, and this is episode 10 of Understanding John Stuart Mill. We're reading from my book of the same name, and we are now at chapter 4. We're still at chapter 4. Uh, we're trying to prove that happiness is the only thing desirable as an end. You may recall uh, in, the, in episode 9 that Mill has two things to prove. That, desirable, that happiness is one of the things desirable as an end, but he wants to also prove that happiness is the only thing desirable as an end, and he has not yet done that. If happiness is the only thing desirable as an end, then it follows that everything else that we call desirable or good is desirable or good because it is a means to happiness. But is there anything besides happiness that might be a candidate for the ultimate end of human action? The traditional reply to this question is virtue and the absence of vice. There are people who desire virtue no less really than pleasure and the absence of pain. Mill says this, And therefore the opponents of the utilitarian standard deem that they have a right to infer that there are other ends of human action besides happiness and that happiness is not the standard of approbation and disapprobation. That's at page 33 of Mill's Utilitarianism. Aristotle might have been an opponent of Mill had he lived in the mid-19th century, and Mill might have dismissed Aristotle's claim that virtue is an end of human action, with the remark that virtue is desired only because it is a means to happiness. Mill would have said virtue is not an end in itself. But instead of saying this, Mill surprises us with this remark. And I'm now quoting from Mill's util Utilitarianism at page 8. The utilitarian doctrine maintains not only that virtue is to be desired, but that it is to be desired disinterestedly for itself. They not only place virtue at the very head of the things which are good as means to the ultimate end, but they also recognize as a psychological fact the possibility of virtue being, to the individual, a good in itself, without looking to any end beyond it, and hold that the mind is not in a right state, not in a state of, that is conformable to utility, not in the state most conducive to the general happiness, unless it does love virtue in this manner, as a thing desirable in itself. Now, how can Mill hold both of the following positions? First, he says that happiness is the only thing desirable as an end. But secondly, he says virtue is a good in itself, without looking to any end beyond it. That just seems a contradiction. If happiness is the only thing that is desirable as an end, then it follows that there is nothing else including virtue, that could also be desirable as an end. To put it bluntly, the second proposition contradicts the first. That is, the proposition that virtue is a good in itself contradicts the proposition that happiness is the only thing desirable as an end. Mill's reply is very clever. This is in, in reading from my book, uh, understanding John Stuart Mill. I'm now, uh, we're still in chapter 4, but we're looking at section 2.1 of pep, chapter 4. And for you, for the, those of you who are reading the hard copy or the paper copy, it's at page 68. The title of this section is called Marts, Parts or Ingredient, Ingredients of Happiness. Mill responds that he has not departed from the happiness principle because he finds no contradiction in holding the two propositions. Here is how he pulls off this little hat trick. First, he claims that happiness has ingredients or parts. That may seem strange. We'll talk about it in a minute. Secondly, the love of virtue for some people can become a part of their conception of happiness. Mill says, although virtue is naturally and originally a means to happiness, it is capable of becoming so. And in those who live it disinterestedly, it has become so, and it is desired and cherished, not as a means to happiness, but as a part of their happiness. So there's some kind of psychological transfer going on from the beginning when virtue is simply a means to happiness. 
it somehow in the years or months or days that follow, it becomes a desired and cherished part of their own happiness. It's not, no longer just a means. Mill, Mill illustrates the process of how a desire for something starts out as a means to one's conception of happiness. And he eventually becomes, and it eventually becomes a part of that conception. His example is the love of money. There's nothing originally more desirable about money than about any heap of littering pebbles. We desire money because of the things which money will buy, food, clothes, shelter. Money is a means to these ends. But at least for some people, the desire to possess money at some point in their lives becomes stronger than the desire to use money. It may then be said, truly, that money is desired now not for the sake of of an end, but as part of the end. From being a means to happiness, money has come to be itself a principal ingredient of that person's conception of happiness. Here's some cases, some actual cases that I'll read to you. This is in a sidebar at the bottom of page 68. Richard Walters, a homeless man who lived in Phoenix, Arizona, died in 2009. He left behind a $4 million estate. He was homeless, but he had an estate of $4 million. A homeless woman who was living out of a shopping cart died on the streets of Manhattan in the same year. They found out that she had secretly amassed nearly $300,000 in her bank account. Third case, a homeless man in Skelefla, Sweden, spent his days collecting tin cans. Many people avoided him because he smelled bad and he had a general lack of hygiene. In 2010, eight months after dying of a heart attack at the age of 60, his relatives discovered that he had left a fortune of $1.66 million. These cases illustrate Mill's point. These people became psychologically incapable of spending the money that they had accumulated. Over time, the love of money became for them an end in itself, not as a means to happiness. It was an end. It is part of the, what they would count as happiness. There's two other examples that Mill has of how this happens. Uh, we're, we've just talked about money. How about fame and power? Think of the aging actress who is severely depressed because she is no longer famous. Or think of the deposed dictator who lives in exile in a luxurious palace, lots of money, but he lapses into depression because he can no longer wield political power. The fame of the actress and the power of the dictator, which were originally a means to happiness, became at some point part of their very conception of happiness. It was so deeply a part of their conception of happiness that they could not be happy without the fame or the power. Now let's bring all this back to virtue. A part or ingredient of happiness is not like a part or ingredient of an automobile or a piece of pie. It's not a tangible object. It is a psychologically necessary condition for happiness. That's what he means by part. It's a desire for something which, if not satisfied, presents that person from being happy. This especially applies to the desire of virtue. Quote, virtue, according to the utilitarian conception, is a good of this description. There was no original desire of it or motive to it, save the conduciveness to pleasure, and especially to protection from pain. But through the association thus formed, it may be felt good in itself, and desired as such with as great intensity as any other good. That's a quote from Mill's Utilitarianism, the original book, uh, at page 37 of the Hackett edition of Mill's Utilitarianism, I should say. The important difference between the love of virtue and the love of money, power, and fame is that the latter three desires can lead to harmful consequences, the lust for money and power being the two which can do the most damage uh, to other people. But the love of virtue can never be harmful to others. It can be cultivated up to the greatest strength as possible without causing harm to anyone. Indeed, the very reverse is true. Those who love virtue can only promote the general happiness. Mill summarizes the argument in the following quote. 
This is at page 37 of Utilitarianism. It results from the preceding considerations that there is in reality nothing desired except happiness. Whatever is desired otherwise than as a means to some and end beyond itself, and ultimately to happiness, is desired as itself a part of happiness, and is not desired for itself until it has become so. So there we have it. That's, that takes us uh, to page 70. Uh, I think I'll go on just a little bit. The next section in chapter 4 is uh, 4.3. And there I put a proof of the utility principle in argument form. Now, of course, it would be best if you had a book in front of you and you could read along with me, but I'll just read through it slowly and let's see how he gets in four premises and a conclusion and one conclusion, five steps, how he gets to the conclusion that the promotion of happiness is the test by which to judge of all human conduct. Okay. He starts out with this uh, premise. If human nature is so constituted as to desire nothing, which is not either a part of happiness or a means to happiness, we can have no other proof and we require no other that, that these are the only things desirable. So that's premise one. Next, Mill adds the following empirical observation. Mankind does desire nothing for itself but that which is a pleasure to them or of which the absence of, is pain. Now, if we combine those two premises, one and two, we can infer the following. Therefore, the only things desirable or good are those which are either a part of happiness or a means to happiness. Happiness, he said, is the sole end of action, of human action. Mildo makes the following hidden assumption, which I put in brackets. Only the desirable and undesirable consequences of an act can be used to determine whether it is right or wrong. I'll repeat that. Only the desirable and undesirable consequences of an act can be used to determine whether that act is right or wrong. Therefore, from all of those principles, or at least from step three down we, we, and four, we get to the conclusion. Therefore, the promotion of happiness is the test by which to judge of all human conduct. Now, there's two unproved premises in this argument, premise two and present four. Mill immediately offers a proof of premise two. We'll talk about that. But he puts off any discussion of premise four until chapter five. So let's take a careful look at premise two, which was mankind desires nothing for itself but that which is a pleasure to them or of which the absence is a pain. Section 4.3.1, Fact and Experience, or a Logical Impossibility. Mill writes that to decide whether it is really true that mankind desires nothing for itself but that which is a pleasure to them, or of which the absence of a pain, he says, is a question of fact or experience. It is an empirical question that can only be answered by evidence. The evidence, of course, is gathered from self-observation and the observation of others. If we look within ourselves, we will find that the things which are a pleasure to us are the same things that we desire. And the things we desire are the things that are also a pleasure to us. Now, Mill does go a bit further by declaring that the words desire and pleasure are, quote, two different modes of naming the same psychological fact. Mill concludes from this brief discussion that, quote, to desire anything in proportion as the idea of it is pleasant is a physical and metaphysical impossibility. So the words desire and pleasure are two different modes of naming the same psychological fact. Now, I would only point out that it is impossible for mankind to desire something which is not a pleasure to them. Then there is no point in looking for evidence to the contrary. If I point to the masochist as an example of someone who desires pain, this would be rejected by claiming that it is not possible to desire pain because the masochist is using the pains as a means to pleasure. Mill guarantees the conclusion that no one desires pain as an end in itself by making it metaphysically or logically impossible to bring a counterexample against it. Section 4 is titled Only the Desirable, I'm sorry, Section 3.2 in Chapter 4 
has the title, Only the Desirable and Undesirable Consequences of an Act Can Be Used to Determine Right and Wrong. The assumption in premise four might be true. Premise four said, Only the desirable and undesirable consequences of an act can be used to determine whether it is right or wrong. That might be true, but it clearly needs an argument for support. We won't get this until the next chapter, chapter five, but we can mention two ethical theories, deontological ethical theories, that are strongly opposed. The theory of natural law, that would be John Locke's uh, uh, theory, and Kant's theory of the categorical imperative. According to Locke, a violation of the natural law is sufficient to conclude that the conduct is morally wrong. For example, if I kill one child, child to save the lives of five children, this is morally wrong, even if it can be calculated that saving the lives of five children would produce much more happiness than unhappiness than would be produced by not killing the one child. And according to Kant, as I discussed in chapter one of this book, where Mill had a little scuffle with Kant, the obligation not to make a false promise is absolute. It is morally wrong to make a false promise no matter what the circumstances including the circumstance that the false premise might have overall, the false promise might have overall good consequences by producing the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So Mill has his opponents. Mill thinks he's defeated all these people, but it's, it, I just want everybody to know that what you've got on one side are, are great philosophers like John Locke and Immanuel Kant, Kant, Kant presenting the natural law as, a, as his own theory, and Kant's presenting his theory of the categorical imperative. Both of them are strongly opposed to, the, to utilitarianism. I think we'll, we'll call this a night uh, as an end. Uh, there is a little bit more in chapter four, but I think what we'll do is, stop, is skip that. It's a section on desire and will, which you might enjoy reading at pages 38 to 39 of Mill's Utilitarianism. And uh, next time we're going to start with chapter five of my book, which is The Connection Between Justice and Utility. By the way, it's also the same chapter in Mill's book, Utilitarianism. Chapter five um, in a Roman, Roman numeral five, that's all the way that we uh, deliver. Chapter five is extremely important, I think, to Mill because he's going to try to bring down both Kant and John Locke. We'll see how he does it. And uh, thank you. I hope you all have uh, a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, we will talk again next Monday. I'm sorry for, uh, for being late this time, uh, but I had computer problems. So it's not, uh, instead of producing this at 5 p.m., it'll probably be more like uh, 7 maybe even 8 p.m. Pacific Coast time in the United States. Thank you very much, and we will talk later. Bye-bye.